please bow with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we come humbly before you yet again this day. And I pray, Lord, that again, as the prayer was this morning, that the focus of our worship, the focus of our time tonight would be on you and you alone. I pray that you might be magnified, that you might be lifted up, and that our hearts might be open to the words that you have for us. I pray that you would be with me tonight. Help me to preach nothing but Christ and, and Christ crucified, Lord. I pray that you'd be with our brothers and sisters that are here tonight. I pray that you might strengthen and encourage them this coming week, give them the rest that they need tonight so that they can be productive in whatever endeavors you have for them, whether it's work, whatever it may be, but help them to shine, Lord. Shine in an extraordinary way so that those around them, those about them, would see you in their lives. I pray that your word would be spread throughout this earth, throughout this world, and we do eagerly anticipate and with open hearts look forward to your mighty return. So be with us now. I recently preached on Ahaz, a dastardly fellow, if you could put it that way. And when I preached on Ahaz, my intention was to preach on Hezekiah. So tonight is a little bit of Ahaz, but a little bit of Hezekiah. But as you'll see, the main emphasis of tonight is on the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we know, King Ahaz of Judah was a horribly wicked king. He sacrificed his sons to the fire as an offering to a false god. He made idolatrous graven images of false gods. He offered pagan sacrifices in the valley of Hinnom, on the high places, the hills, and under every green tree. And when surrounded by enemy nations, he turned down the free offer of victory through the one true God, and chose rather to trust in the strength of man by placing himself and the nation of Judah under the yoke of the Assyrian Empire becoming their puppet. Ahaz then adopted their religious practices that he combined with bits of biblically sound worship and satanic synchronistic syncretism of false worship taking place in the very temple of God itself. That happened in Jerusalem. And Second Chronicles 28, 19 tells us that Ahaz brought about unrestraint in Judah and was very unfaithful to the Lord. Things got worse for him, and yet Second Chronicles 28, 22 says that despite his distress, he became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. Then in verse 25, it says that quite plainly that Ahaz provoked the Lord, the God of his fathers, to anger. And finally, in verse 27, it says that when he died, they didn't even bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel for burial. This weak and wicked man wasn't even worthy enough to be buried with the other kings who had gone before him. Now, what's so striking about Ahaz and why it's important to remember him, among other reasons, is the comparison, the stark contrast between Ahaz and his son Hezekiah. Hezekiah was no ordinary king after all, for we see in Scripture that he stands tall as an extraordinary king, one of the very best in all of the Bible, and his godly life stands out all the more when compared to the life of his father Ahaz. So let's see what God's Word has to say about Hezekiah. That's in 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6, if you'd like to turn there. 2 Kings 18, 1 through 6. Now it came about in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Ella, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abi, the, da the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So as we delve into God's word tonight, 
I would like to stress first and foremost of all the biblical truths that we look at, one of, the th- one of them to take away is that fathers play a significant role in our society, in our culture, and in the world we live in. Whether it's today, the past, you name it, fathers play a significant role. Now in our own day and age, fathers have taken a back seat, if you will, and have in many ways become objects of scorn and ridicule. Gone are the days of the, digni- the dignified fathers of the past when you would turn on the TV show and you might watch a classic TV show like uh, Leave it to Beaver and you'd see a father like Ward Cleaver giving good advice to Jerry Mathers the Beave. And you might also turn on a TV show and as often as when, even when I was a kid, I would turn on a show on the summer morning when I was uh, in, in the morning before going to school, I watched the Andy Griffith show. And there you'd see Andy Griffith playing Sheriff Andy Taylor and he was providing us and providing people that were watching a dignified example of what a father is to be. Now for the past 30 plus years, most television shows seem fit to poke fun at fatherhood by foisting fathers like Homer Simpson and Al Bundy upon us, demonstrating our culture's revulsion and rebellion against fathers. Fatherhood also in the family itself is derided and scorned. So we're surrounded, it seems, with a continual assault on the family and fathers in particular. Dads and their role in society is being undermined and redefined so that we're left with emasculated men unwilling and unready to lead their families as God intended. But make no mistake, God has established the nuclear family, a father and mother, as the basic protective unit in society. That fa- the family was established to raise children and to promote peace and stability in society. The family dynamics, uh, specifically focusing on fathers at this point, and their roles gives us greater understanding also of God and the Trinity. In fact, as Tim Challies writes, imagine there was a place with no fathers and sons. In that place, you would have trouble explaining John 3.16. For God, the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you don't understand the powerful natural love and protection of a father for his son, how could you understand what it costs God to provide his beloved son as a sacrifice? Now, we've got a lot of problems in our society and our culture, but if you even would go for a minute, if we could somehow elect all the very best political candidates to office in every single election, it wouldn't make a difference if dads continue to shirk their crucial roles in our society. If our families continue to be shattered and broken. If you want to know what's wrong with our culture, look no further than the family with some 40% of children born out of wedlock and many reared without a father or otherwise shuffled between two houses, oftentimes with a mom and dad with starkly different values and beliefs. Now again, all these children being born out of wedlock, it is a tremendous problem but it, if you go behind that, you'll see that it's more than anything a spiritual problem indicative in our society. So a child might, for instance, have one parent who holds firm to traditional values, maybe even Christian, perhaps even a believing parent. And while residing with that parent, this child might get a good dose of wisdom and insight and biblical truth. But unfortunately, once that child leaves and is at the other parent's house, he might find himself in a totally different environment, an ungodly environment, freed from the constraints and confines of the structure of the other home and free to do whatever he pleases. Any positive impact from the first home is often removed by the negative impact of the second home. So if you happen to be in this type of situation, do not fret, but place your focus on Christ and remain faithful to him and his word. And you'll see what transforming work he can accomplish in your life and also in the lives of your children. So be vigilant about that and be encouraged in God's word. God can take the broken pieces of our lives and make us whole again. He will do that. He has done that. So then we are often defined by our fathers. If you are blessed, um, if, if we are blessed with a good, godly father, a believing father, then we are given a glimpse into what our heavenly father is. God gives us this picture, helping us to comprehend him with more clarity. This godliness also helps boys to grow up to be godly men 
as they follow in their father's footsteps. And in girls, it helps them to also grow up to be godly women and to see the type of man that they perhaps might marry someday should they be called to marriage. Now, Ahaz was certainly not a godly man by any stretch of the imagination. He was a wicked king, quite plainly from Scripture. He did not do what was right in the eyes of God. Now, some people, especially in our present day and age, might use having a bad parent as some sort of psychological crutch and excuse for everything bad that's happened to them. You know, this, it's all because of my parents. That's why I, I can't make these right decisions. It's all their fault. But that's not the biblical way. That's not God's way. God is our Father, isn't he? He provides all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He is the great comforter. And if we happen to have a terrible father, a horrible father, like Hezekiah, we have an example of what not to be. Hezekiah had the example of his father Ahaz. He knew exactly what not to be. So you do not have to be defined by a terrible father if you have one. And in fact, it could be a tremendous amount of instruction for you, an example of how not to be. Now looking at 2 Kings 18, we see that Hezekiah did the complete opposite of his father in terms of approach to the Lord and also as king. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. I just love saying that word, Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like, like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. That's Hezekiah. And we've got a society where parents, especially mothers, are taught that being a mother in a biblical sense is something to be scorned and looked down upon rather than elevated and lifted up and praised. Raising children, it seems, is not worthy of the pursuit of women in this day and age. Rather than investing your time in raising children and raising up the next generation of adults, the most important job, you could argue, or even the next generation of believers, more importantly, you'd be much happier and more fulfilled if you invested your time in something else of considerably far more value and significance. That's the world's mindset, isn't it? It's never occurred to them, perhaps the utter importance, the necessity and the necessary role that mothers play in impressing upon their children and instilling godliness in a child's life. 2 Kings 18.2 tells us that Hezekiah's mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. And Abby is a contraction of her longer name, Abijah as seen in 2 Chronicles 29, 1. Her name means, the Lord is my father, which is ironic in terms of what we're preaching tonight, right? The Lord is my father. So in light of tonight's message, we should really pay close attention to that. The Lord is my father. Her father's name was Zechariah, and we read about him in 2 Chronicles 24, 20 through 22. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus God has said, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord and do not prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord. He has also forsaken you. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which his father Jehoiada had shown him, but he murdered his son, and as he died, uh, referring to Zechariah, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. So Hezekiah therefore followed not in the ungodliness of his father Ahaz, but in the, go- the godliness of his mother's family and had a true zeal, passion, and love for the Lord and his ways. Mothers never underestimate the impact and the necessity of your high and holy calling to raise up the next generation of believers. Now we're facing an all-out attack against mothers and fathers and against the family in our society and against our, in our culture today. That's nothing new, though. We see it in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, and in our own age, we are surrounded. We're surrounded. The word for it is a synopticon. We're surrounded on all sides, education, entertainment, government, society. They're all surrounding us, this worldly system, this cosmos under the power and control of the evil one. The God of this world, Satan, is directing it all. He's engaged in a full-on assault against the family. And literally in the past 20 years, we have seen the definition of the family completely redefined 
from what it meant since the very beginning of time. Ted McAllister and Bruce Fronin in their book, Coming Home, they write, Our society shies away from asking whether it has made life better or worse for children by viewing the family through the lenses of public recognition and public policy rather than our understanding of who we are and what makes life worth living. The family, however, is not some abstract ideal. The family is comprised of a father and mother and their children. Today's society has redefined family to mean a collection of people sharing certain needs, beliefs, and experiences as they pursue their own individual needs of self-expression, recognition, and emotional support. The family is something, they write, that can be taxing, it can be demanding, but it's something that's far more rewarding than one's own individualistic pursuits and is essential to the formation and maintenance of a self-governing and virtuous society. Both parents must take part over time in the rearing and raising of children. Both mother and father must be committed. It is the example of a strong, responsible father who instills the traits of hard work and responsibility that leads young men to become protectors rather than abusers. It is the example of a strong, responsible mother who instills the habits of caring and restraint that leads young women to be nurturers rather than users or the abused. It is the example and experience of a strong family in which each does his or her part to serve the common good that teaches all young people to place the interests of others, especially their children, above their own. And most importantly, I would add to McAllister and Fronin, it is godly parents who set the example in their lives and teach their children the singular importance of believing in the Lord Jesus and trusting and obeying his word. But for decades now, the government, the schools, the media, the arts, entertainment, you name it, have all pushed this idea that the family as the Bible defines it is unnatural and even sinister. But God is above all of this. He can take a fractured family and out of it produce a godly man or woman, and that's what we see here in 2 Kings 18. But let's take a deeper look into this fractured family that Hezekiah came from and find out, and from out of it, what God produced. So I'd like to emphasize the words of Job. No purpose of God will be thwarted. No purpose of God will be thwarted. In 2 Chronicles 26.3, the biblical narrative tells us that Ahaz burned his sons in fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. These offerings made whether to Baal or Molech, later chapters in 2 Kings and Jeremiah suggest Molech, paints a picture of one of the most sickening scenes of depravity in all of Scripture. For God strictly prohibits child sacrifice as seen in Leviticus 18.21, Leviticus 22 through 5, and 2 Kings 23 10, and in Jeremiah 32 35. Molech worship included child sacrifice or passing children through fire. You'll recall that God drove most of the Canaanites from the promised land, due in part to abominations such as child sacrifice. It is believed that idols of Molech were giant metal statues of a man with a bull's head. Each image had a hole in the abdomen and possibly outstretched forearms that made a kind of a ramp to the hole. A fire was lit in or around the statue. Babies were placed in the statue's arms or in the hole. And when a couple sacrificed their children, they believed that Molech would ensure financial prosperity for the family and future generation. An ancient source describes the following. There stands in their midst a bronze statue its hands extended over a bronze brazier, the flames of which engulf the child. When the flames fall upon the body, the little limbs contract and the open mouth seems almost to be laughing until the contracted body slips quietly into the brazier. Thus it is that the grin is known as sardonic laughter since they die laughing. A sickening, vile, and abominable. Now going back to 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28, these children that Ahaz sacrificed to Molech, they were the siblings of Hezekiah. And what about the fact that Ahaz offered Hezekiah's brothers to Molech? What's behind all of this? What's important about it other than to point out the obvious that Ahaz was bad and child sacrifice bad? 
And how does it relate to the biblical truth that no plan of God will be thwarted? If you pull away the veil of child sacrifice in the biblical narrative, and I'd venture to say even in our own day and age, what's behind it, or perhaps more correctly, who's behind it is the proper question. If you remove the veil, you'll find that this evil force and power behind it is none other than Satan himself. Looking back into the narratives in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, we see that Ahaz was so completely given over to his pagan practices, so darkened and demented, that it's not a stretch to say that behind all of his paganism was the scheming of the devil himself. You can't turn away from God in utter disbelief, throw yourself into paganism, throw yourself into religious syncretism, and somehow escape Satan's influence. Now, if you're involved in paganism, like Ahaz, you're of Satan. At the very heart of paganism and false religion is the throne of Satan undergirded by his doctrine of demons. Ahaz certainly desired to do evil. He willed to do evil. He purposed it and was responsible for his actions. But behind all of this scheming was Satan. Behind all of this child sacrifice is Satan. And all of the children offered to false gods then and now are offered to Satan. Pharaoh's murder of the Israelite baby boys in Exodus, satanic. Athaliah's murder of her grandchildren so that she could rule from the throne in 2 Kings 11, satanic. Herod's slaughter of the baby boys under the age of two in Matthew's gospel, satanic. For from the very beginning, Satan has been sneaking and scheming trying to thwart and prevent God's plan of redemption. He's been trying to suppress it since the beginning. In 1 John 3, 8, we read, The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And in John 8, 44, the apostle tells us that the devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him, Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is a murderer and the father of lies. And we know from Genesis that he is crafty and clever. For it was he who deceived Adam and Eve and helped usher sin into this world. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, appeared to destroy these works, to provide a way for man to again have a way to God, and redeem this fallen world. God's redemptive plan was put in place as we read prophetically in in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you, meaning Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he, Jesus, shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. The devil, he knew God had a plan, and he wanted to thwart this redemptive plan, and here in 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28, Satan is attempting to thwart God's plan. For by murdering Ahaz's children, Satan was trying to destroy the seed of David and prevent the eventual incarnation and birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. But Satan fell, didn't he? He failed, and Hezekiah somehow, and the Bible remains silent here, but Hezekiah somehow escaped the fires of Molech, and grew up to be a man. And not only that, Hezekiah, the Bible tells us, replaced his wicked father as a king when he died. God found a way. He found a way. God finds a way, doesn't he? God preserved Hezekiah so that through him, mankind might have access to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son, and then life abundantly through the work of the Holy Spirit. Those of you who are in Christ, You wouldn't be here today had God not preserved this godly man, Hezekiah. The very fact that God made a way for Hezekiah 2,700 years ago and then made a way for you in this present age when you cast your eyes upon Jesus and believed in him is staggering. This is no mere historical footnote or a made-up fairy tale. This is real and has had lasting effects on you and me. Let's think about the magnitude of it. Try to experience and comprehend just for a moment the magnitude of it all. Have you ever watched a movie, perhaps um, a mystery or a thriller type of film? One of those, uh, for the folks in here that that have have been around a little bit longer than the rest of us, maybe one of those films like a Hitchcock movie, or for the younger people, maybe an M. Night Shyamalan movie. And in these movies, you have 
a situation where bits and pieces of the movie are thrown in here and there, a glimpse, a picture, and it doesn't always make sense at first. But somehow, some way, when all is said and done, at the climax of the film, the final revelation, the big picture is presented, and the rug is pulled out from underneath you, and you're left in wonder. Your mind is blown at, as all these little things that happen in the movie come together to create this unlikely chain of events that inevitably leads to this fantastic and amazing ending. The unbelievable has happened, and you never saw it coming. But then when you look back on it all, maybe you watch the movie again, you see these hints and foreshadowing of things to come. That you see that they were all there, and once you have the big picture, this unlikely turn of events, this chain reaction doesn't seem so implausible. In fact, you see that rather than being some random series of accidents, it was really a remarkably well-engineered plot that is beautifully woven and created to succeed despite any efforts to stop or suppress it from coming into being. But you see now, I'm not really describing a movie, am I? I'm really describing to you the redemptive plan of God laid out in the person of Jesus Christ. God's word, the story of his redemptive plan that all points to Christ. The inexorable piecing together of all the pieces of the puzzle could not be stopped. God's plan will not be thwarted. In the Old Testament, God is weaving this great redemptive narrative of history together, beginning with the prophecy of Jesus Christ in Genesis, just a glimpse then, and a few glimpses here and there throughout the Old Testament. In the faith, in the lives of the Old Testament, saints and prophets and kings, the law of Moses and the prophets, pointing man to a greater covenant, and then at the right time, the Lord Jesus Christ is finally revealed. Types of Christ all pointing to the true Christ. Types of priests all pointing to the true priests. Types of kings, like godly King Hezekiah, pointing to the true king. The hope the saints of old longed to see as they looked forward to Christ's day, as their hearts burned with desire, at the very thought of the heavenly country to come that they'd been promised by faith, that they grabbed a hold of in faith despite the distance of time, until all would be revealed in Christ. The magnitude of it all. God revealed in the flesh, truly God, truly man. That's why Moses was willing to consider the reproaches of Christ as greater than all that Egypt had to offer. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In this day and age, we no longer have to look for hints of things to come, do we? We're exceedingly blessed beyond all measure, aren't we? For in this present day, we have the ability to look back on the biblical narrative, redemptive history, in the pages of God's word. We have the benefit of looking back in time and seeing how God in his infinite wisdom used so many humble people in unique and unusual ways through twists and turns and satanic opposition, yet still found a way for his redemptive plan to stand. We should be filled with awe and wonderment as we consider all the work God went through to save us from our sins. The plan started in the recesses of eternity past, before the foundation of the world, through the eternal counsel of God, it then worked its way out in our world thousands of years ago. And there you are sitting here today because of what Jesus Christ did for you. Consider for a moment as you sit here the work that Christ has done in your life and how you came to know him, your salvation and what it took, and how long it's been in the making. And then you will understand why Hezekiah is important because if he hadn't been preserved, you wouldn't be here today. God's plan wouldn't have succeeded. But let's be real here. There never really was any doubt that God's plan wouldn't work. There was never a chance of God's plan failing. His plans will not be thwarted. He is God and his will, his plan will not be thwarted and will not be frustrated. Not by human efforts and certainly not by the pathetic efforts on the part of Satan or his hordes. No, as the reformer Martin Luther penned in his majestic hymn, a mighty fortress, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. And if we move from the grand scheme of things corporately and zooming in on the individual members of Christ's body, the church, saints of the past and saints of the present, God's purpose in our individual lives will not be thwarted. Perhaps you had godly parents and came from a Christian home. And maybe you are the first Christian in your family. Either way, the purpose of God in your life 
has not and will not be thwarted. That's the doctrine of irresistible grace. The sovereign work of the Holy Spirit who convicts, calls, draws, and regenerates elect sinners. This work unfailingly results in the faith of all those chosen, all whom the Father chose in eternity past, and all of those for whom the Son died are those whom the Spirit brings to faith in Jesus Christ. All these individual works in God in our separate lives are all perfectly woven together in this grand and glorious redemptive tapestry, all pointing to Jesus Christ. All of the glory is his in each and all of our lives. Yes, our paths may cross, as they certainly do in this local body, or even with believers that have come in and out of our lives. But the overarching theme of all of our lives, saints past and present, is the incomparable Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we might have come to Christ at different times. Some of you here are newer believers. Others of you have trusted in him for many, many years. But in all of our stories, Jesus Christ arrived at just the right time. Romans 5, 6 tells us, at the right time, Christ died for us. And Galatians 4, 4 through 5 also tells us, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God arrived at just the right time, not only in our own lives, but in the greater, greater narrative of redemptive history. His timing is always perfect. Just when all looked grim and desperate, God orchestrated the events of history at the right time and preserved Hezekiah and then through his seed entered history. God in the flesh, truly man, truly God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and died on the cross. And those of you who are in Christ, who believe in him, will experience the eternal joy, riches, and glory that he has in store for you as you marvel at him in all of his splendor and glory. And those of you who don't know Christ, he has made a way. And not just the way, not just a way, but the way. The one and only way for you to come to him, a plan from eternity past whose time has arrived for you on this very day, at this very moment, if you only humble yourselves and place your faith in him. The very fact that you are alive and breathing is a gift from God. And if, we, if he would stop your heart from beating tomorrow, it would be too late. Don't delay. Believe in him while there's still time, while you still have life in you. Repent and acknowledge him as Savior and as Lord. It doesn't matter whether you've had a godly mother or father. All the same, trust in God. Trust in Jesus Christ. Now, those of you who have godly parents, who have pointed the way of Christ to you, it matters in that you will bear far more responsibility and accountability on the day of judgment for rejecting God than the unbelieving person unexposed to the gospel. So if you have believing parents, praise God for their examples and then follow their examples and believe. If you don't have godly parents, might I venture to say that if you've had a bad parent who hurt you, scarred you, and left you, burdened with pain today, you are being presented with an opportunity to lay aside your burdens and accept and embrace the Father. Accept His embrace as well. Because you have a Father in heaven who will neither leave you nor forsake you, and the Lord God Almighty is proud to call you his son, and he's proud to call you his daughter. So please bow with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died for us on the cross. We thank you that it was something that was planned in eternity past, the magnitude of which our, our minds can't even fully comprehend. We thank you for it, and, and when we see that you've called us to yourself, it should humble us before you should drive us to you, cause us to repent and to confess our sins before you. And we do pray, Lord, that if there's someone here tonight that doesn't know you, that you would soften their hearts, that you would draw them to yourself, Lord, so that they can come before God and honestly call God their Father. And as I noted here, Lord, we know, God the Father, that, that you are not afraid to call us your sons, you're not afraid to call us your daughters, that we've been transformed. Our bodies, our minds, everything will be completely transformed and when we die and we're in heaven, we'll be completely new creations, Lord. And even now as we're here on this earth, Lord, if we're in you, we're new creations. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. 
be with us now. And thank you that we have a Father in heaven that loves and adores us and that has a plan for each and every one of our lives if we're in him. To God be the glory. May all praise and honor be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but is now manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen.